um, warm welcome to this event and um, run by the Innovation Forum Manchester. Today we will be focusing on material science for healthcare and nanomedicine. Um, thank you very much for being with us this evening. Appreciate with uh, various different commitments in this day and age, along with uh, homeschooling, not least. Um, we really appreciate you giving up your valuable time in the evening to be here with us um, for this, no doubt, insightful discussion. Um, as previously discussed, uh, this event is being run by Innovation Forum Manchester. We are a specific branch of the Innovation Forum, which is a global not-for-profit organisation promoting entrepreneurship in the life sciences. Um, I am really pleased to, to welcome you this evening to this online webinar. Um, it will run approximately for the next two to two and a half hours um, and via this new platform um, for us at least hop in. Uh, this has been made possible uh, by and as always thanks to our generous sponsors Manchester Biogel and BRS Recruitment. Um, I'll run you through some, some features of the software and house rules in a minute. However, please first allow me to introduce our speakers via the agenda as we have some fantastic keynotes and founders delivering their views on this space uh, lined up for you all this evening. Uh, so first we have the welcome and introduction to the Innovation Forum delivered by myself. Um, following an agenda of two keynote speakers originally, and then three um, founders pitches from prolific advanced materials startups across the Northwest, followed by a panel and Q&A um, and then a speed networking session. Um, please note that in the original agenda, we did have Professor Paul Townsend speaking um, as our first keynote. However, very unfortunately, due to last minute circumstance, he won't be able to join us um, tonight. We will therefore be going um, straight to the keynote delivered by Professor Sarah Cartmel. Um, so we're actually using a different platform to Zoom tonight, as you're uh, no doubt already aware. I appreciate that some features are different and new for you all as well as us. Um, hopefully we um, or some of you will already have been able to participate in the speed networking function. Um, due to the time before the run up to the event. Um, however, for those of you who have just joined, I'd encourage you to briefly um, explore the features of the software itself. So for example, the expo section on the tab to the left contains booths from our sponsors. Please do have a look in this section to find out more about the organizations that we partner with um, and actually chat with our sponsors directly. We do have a representative of the Innovation Forum Manchester in there as well. Um, the speed networking function is also found to the left um, on the tab on the left hand side of the screen, whereby you'll be matched at random with another attendee of the webinar with a total time of three minutes to introduce yourself. Um, if you want to follow up afterwards, please feel free to invite them to a private video chat. Um, we would encourage you to follow up on the most fruitful of these conversations. Um, and the reason why we have set this networking function to the speed setting um, is really to simulate the experience of a real event and increase exposure among the audience members to each other. So really hope you find that a useful feature. Um, as always, we're looking for feedback on our events, so please let us know your thoughts and comments in, in the chat function of the right hand side of the screen um, on the main stage where you are all viewing me talk from now to the right hand side. Please post your questions and comments in here, along with any technical issues that you might be having. Um, and my colleague Nazir will endeavour to try and support you in those. Um, please also post your questions for the speakers uh, to be addressed in the Q&A and panel in that chat box. Um, if there is a question for one speaker specifically, please do include um, the address that you would like that question to be put to. And you'll also find some polls in that section. Please feel free to participate in those also. Um, all the live action tonight will be happening on the main stage. For example, our keynote speeches and discussion panel and we will be having a brief intermission between each speaker, so please don't be alarmed by that. 
Um, a bit about the Innovation Forum itself, for those of you um, who are attending an Innovation Forum run event for the first time, a very warm welcome. Fantastic to have you with us. Um, as I mentioned, we are a global not-for-profit organization um, with the goal of promoting entrepreneurship in the life sciences. And we are truly global um, in the sense that we have over 20 strategic locations. Um, we've held over 200 events in the last seven, eight years that we've been in operation um, all over the world. And via our Imagine If program, which I'll speak to in a minute, we have evaluated and supported over 600 early stage biotech and healthcare focused startups who have gone on to raise over 100 million uh, private venture funding in those seven years, which is a metric that we are incredibly proud of. So speaking to the Manchester branch specifically, um, this is us. We are students, postdocs and professionals. Uh, mostly addressing issues in biotech and life sciences and based across across the Northwest. Um, we're particularly passionate about entrepreneurship. Special credit uh, to Ruben, um, who has carefully curated this evening's event, and additionally to Nazir and Andrea. Andrea will be heading up the Innovation Forum booth in the Expo section, so please feel free to head over and have a chat with him directly. Um, if you want to know more about the Innovation Forum, specifically um, our activities in Manchester. So these are just a few of our generous sponsors. As I mentioned earlier, we do rely on sponsors for their kind support. Um, thanks again to our sponsors for this evening, Manchester Biogel and BRS Recruitment. In terms of an overview of Innovation Forum's activities, um, we really run a range of events from quite informal, casually focused initiatives, for example, Pitch in a Pub, um, through our pre-accelerator competition, which is our flagship initiative, to large scale professionally focused events such as Health Horizons Future Healthcare Forum, which was our global conference in 2019. Um, this year, obviously, the move to, to a virtual world has been difficult for us, given that uh, predominantly our events were in person pre-coronavirus. However, we've managed to successfully ex execute over 23 webinars since April, um, obviously tying into that wider, wider narrative that Innovation Forum globally um, is a collaboration between branches. In terms of our Imagine If competition, um, as I mentioned, this is really our flagship event. Uh, we just closed applications and shortlisted the Manchester cohort, which we are very excited about. Um, we usually take around 10 of the top startups from across the Northwest, and we give them access to mentorship and non-dilutive funding, um, culminating in the local finals pitching event, which will be on the 22nd of April. Um, which is a really, it's a great chance and a great opportunity for those startups to showcase not only themselves, uh, but the progress they've made in that period. So I hope to see you all there on the 22nd of April. Uh, in the next few slides, I wanted to give a brief idea of the um, extent of our impact. So you can see uh, we had over 300 applications to the Global Imagine If competition this year, and they really came from across the world, uh, but mostly focused in Europe and the UK. Um, and we do focus on the life sciences sector um, in broad terms. So you can see that our three main sectors are in convergent tech, digital health and medical devices. And those being, um, sorry, applications that we've received to the Imagine If competition. So very briefly, um, please find our contact details and social media channels um, on this slide. Please give us a like, a follow or a share. We'd love to hear from you and interact with you. Um, of course, please do reach out with any questions or further queries about the Innovation Forum. Um, the channel doesn't really matter. Uh, things always tend to get back to the same place. So please do reach out because we'd love to hear from you um, and also specifically to share your feedback. Um, on this event. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, without further ado, I will 
Um, I will go backstage and shortly you will be hearing from Professor Sarah Cartmel, our first keynote speaker of this evening. Thank you. Good evening again, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to introduce our first keynote speaker of this evening's online webinar, Professor Sarah Cartmel, um, currently head of the Department of Materials, uh, which is home to nearly 2,000 students and staff. She is also the UK Biomedicals Materials Champion for the Henry Royce Institute. Um, Sarah's interdisciplinary research area focuses on creating a paradigm shift in healthcare treatments. And her research is in the area of orthopedic tissue engineering, wound care treatments, and more recently, translating the 3D tissue growth techniques to cancer research for early biomarker detection. So without further ado, Sarah, please go ahead um, and begin. Thank you. Many thanks, Gemma, for the introduction and also thanks to the innovation um, team for inviting me here today to speak to you all. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I've been asked to speak a little bit about my research, my own research, but also about the activity in the, the biomedical materials theme in the Royce Institute. Hence the quite strange title that you see there on the right hand side, Biomedical Materials in the Royce Institute and the Cartmel Laboratory. Um, so the first couple of slides I'll be telling you about my own work and then I'll move on to the Royce Institute and the exciting opportunities that might be there for, for all of you. Um, so my own research interests that you can see here, they lie in the area of biomaterials and tissue engineering and more specifically that you can see in this top uh, blue box at the top here, um, you can see I have a focus on orthopaedics, which specifically includes bone, cartilage, tendon, ligament, tissue engineering. I also have a portfolio of work on wound care products um, for the focus on treatments of chronic wounds, for, uh, for treatment of diabetic, diabetic ulcers. And recently I've started work with the uh, Manchester Cancer Research Centre, transferring some of this technology for um, developing a lung cancer model to um, that can be used for biomarkers for early detection of lung cancer. And to do this, my lab has expertise in developing and testing different biomaterials, which include electrospun polymers, an example you can see here in this image at the top, and different hydrogel systems and composites of such. And we're also interested in different types of stimulus applied to those cells. So once those cells are seeded onto a scaffold and we create a 3D tissue, in order to influence the cell activity, we apply different types of stimulus. Um, and that activity could be proliferation, differentiation or extracellular matrix production. And in my group, I specifically started working with mechanotransduction, so mechanical forces, and then more recently over the last 10 years or so, electrical stimulation and how we can use different electrical regimes to, again, uh, alter proliferation differentiation and indeed external matrix uh, production. Now, in order to apply these different stimuli and grow 3D tissues, one needs to control the environment. And in order to do this, I have a large body of research where we design different types of bioreactors. And here you can see an example of a schematic of a capacitive um, electrical stimulating bioreactor that we've designed. And, um, and also a co-culture bioreactor you can see here, stainless steel um, chamber we can uh, re-autoclave and, and reuse again and again for the growth of osteochondral tissue, so bone and cartilage tissue um, together. And then lastly, my lab is also interested in developing new methodologies to provide information about the tissues we're trying to create. So I've researched developing commuted tomography imaging to either track live cells through scaffolds, for example, or indeed provide 3D high resolution structural information on um, soft tissues. The examples that you see here is uh, an interior um, cruciate ligaments from, uh, from a porcine model that we've imaged and we've been able to track different individual fascicles throughout that structure and we've been able to do that in an aqueous, actually PBS, phosphoric buffer saline environment and keep that wet. But you can see here we tracked individual fascicles all the way through um, either a static or a dynamic uh, loaded tissue. So we just wanted to give, uh, take the opportunity to give you an example of one piece of one type of medical product that we're translating um, through uh, my laboratory. And this is a tendon repair product. And you can see here, there's a focus on hand tendon injury with over 30,000 um, hand tendons treated annually in the UK. You can see here with this bullet. 
Now, these are usually trauma cases that presented at accident and emergency. And uh, essentially what happens is the surgeon sutures these two uh, quite healthy uh, tendons otherwise, but they've, they've, they've had this acute trauma um, and they present at the A&E and the surgeon sutures them together using these different types of suture knots. So you can see here the savage suture knots, this cartoon just shows a sort of cut tendon ends, um, the, the Kessler, for example. And the first three months, this 12 week rehabilitation, the first three months of repair is really important. And currently a quarter of these repairs have a poor outcome and 7% of these we rupture and obviously there's associated um, economic uh, cost to that, but obviously um, patient quality of health. So what we've been doing in my laboratory is to develop a, uh, a product that actually augments the current suturing technique that offers a bridge to aid the healing tendon. And so this is just a couple of pictures and images to describe the, the product itself, which is a, a patent. It's got a worldwide patent right now, and it's electrospond polycaprolactone device. You can see that we have very small fibres that you can see here on the top left hand side, where we, the, the cells can recognise being similar to naturally occurring external matrix morphology. And then we can twist these fibres and create this yarn. And essentially, we can then knit that yarn and create this device. And this device is then inserted, you can see here, into the tendon. So this is our normal kind of this is an example of a, a Kessler knot, uh, the knots inside here. This is the full suture. This is our tendon itself. And we use this hollow board needle that you can see here. And we introduce our product, the device here, into the center of the tendon. And then it sits just in between very easily. We take out that needle and then essentially we have lots of data showing um, in different uh, animal models and in vitro models not only safety, but also efficacy of the product. And you can see here uh, just the cartoon demonstrating without the device where we have a tendon re-rupturing and with the device, which has added this biomimicry where we can actually have a bridge where the cells can, can migrate across and lay down um, excellent matrix and have this um, earlier wound healing, but also a more functional wound healing outcome. So the product degrades with 50% remaining after about 12 months. Um, we see uh, an increase in strength at three weeks with the product in place, an increase of extra matrix proteins and reduction of inflammation with the product in place in comparison just to the suture alone. And we're currently at the stage of moving this product to clinical trial and are liaising heads of terms with licensing the technology with a company. So I don't have long to talk to you. So that's, uh, this is the only kind of information I want to tell you about my own research. The, the rest of the talk, I wanted to take you through um, what we do with the Sir Henry Royce Institute. And for those of you that haven't heard about it, the Henry Royce Institute is a new UK Institute for Advanced Materials. Um, it's administered through the University of Manchester, where I'm based, but it involves uh, several different partners. And our overall purpose, you can see here in the top left hand side, is to establish and develop and capitalise on the UK's world leading excellence in advanced materials research that already exists, but also move that further forward and be internationally leading in that area. And our overall vision is to be a world leading institute identifying challenges and stimulating innovation in advanced materials research to support and sustain growth and development. You can see on the right hand side here, there are kind of five different areas and challenges that we're looking at. So obviously there's low carbon power, which is a common theme globally, infrastructure and mobility, digital communication, circular economy. And the last one, which is really the, the challenge where my research fits into mostly is health and well-being. Now, of course, biomedical materials is not an, an indeed uh, clinical challenges doesn't only fit into health and well-being. There are other health and well-being concerns such as uh, water treatment, healthy um, sanitation, that sort of thing that advanced materials for sustainable society and the indeed the institute can um, uh, help with. The institute itself adds is, is essentially a single front door for users. So um, any uh, UK and indeed international partners, but mainly um, we've been working with partners within the UK um, researchers that are academic, but also industry, um, small to medium enterprises, but also large corporations are welcome to come and uh, use the facilities that we have within the uh, Henry Royce Institute. So we have this single front door ethos. You come in the front door and we can guide you to the expertise that's needed. You come with your query and um, the, uh, the problem that you need solving, the challenge that you have. As I mentioned before, in this section B, we're the University of Manchester, we're the Royce Hub. So we have a physical building that's just got up and actually just opened. The biomaterials labs have just opened this January 2021. Uh, and we're doing the research physically in that building now. But we have lots of other partners. That is the, the Royce, Sheffield, Imperial, Leeds, Cambridge, NNL, Liverpool, Atomic Energy Authority and Oxford are the main partners. 
And in terms of figures, what we've been able to do, we've had over 200 million pounds of investment, not only in the infrastructure itself, but also investment into equipment, which then rises to over 250 open access facilities across the UK um, that you can see here on the map and is already uh, leading to uh, thousands of hours of equipment use and will be more now we've got the actually hub building open. On the hub itself, our, uh, before I focus in our biomedical materials research theme, um, our mission, our overall mission is to support and grow world recognised excellence, as I mentioned before, in UK materials research. We want to accelerate commercial exploitation and deliver positive economic and societal impact for the UK. And we propose to do that in four different ways. And one of those is enabling the materials research collaboration and strategy. We also have the second point that you can see here to provide access to the latest facilities and capability. And the Royce isn't just about facilities. It's worth bearing that in mind. It's not just we've spent millions of pounds investing into state of the art bits of kit. And I'll give you an examples of some of those in the biomedical materials um, area that I've been working in. Um, but it's not just about actually the kit and equipment access. It's actually about enabling this, this collaboration and the strategy that you see in one, uh, point one, but also in points three and four, where we have we want to uh, catalyze this industrial collaboration. It's not just about academics. It's about translating and having the impact um, of uh, materials, actually seeing it um, and, and accelerating that all the way through and exploiting uh, the materials research that's going on in the UK. And then lastly is more about skills training and this is fostering the material science skills development, innovation training and outreach. Um, we've been successful um, uh, in a CDT, for example, in biomedical materials that started in 2019 that I'm director of and it was funding £6.7 million uh, pounds to train 53 new PhD researchers in the area of biomedical materials research and they will be, this is over the next eight years, and they will be our next generation of leaders in this field and this is something that the voice is contributing to. So the theme that I'm uh, being uh, involved with leading and, and Johnny Blaker at Manchester has taken over a lot of this over the last um, uh, few months. Our overall vision, we, we developed a um, a roadmap, uh, a landscape um, exercise with the UK community. So we developed this vision, which I'll go through shortly, with um, around about 200 different stakeholders with, within the UK, um, probably about 18 months, uh, uh, two years ago. And we asked the big question, you know, what What's the big science? What would make a difference? And the overall theme that came back with resonating through is that we really need acceleration of the work that we're doing. So rather than just focus on just fiber tech or add it to manufacture, it's not just about that. It's about accelerating all the innovation that we've got. I think in the UK, we have some great ideas, but it's about making sure that the UK is translating those ideas. And we identified some of those um, uh, bottlenecks in terms of um, the uh, in order to accelerate that translation in some of the equipments we spent over about 10 million pounds worth of equipment um over the last uh, couple of years in biomedical materials manufacturing and testing characterization and we really wanted to focus on the acceleration and discovery and manufacture of these biomedical materials in order to do that so not only acceleration, and that means improving our throughput in manufacturer, in, uh, improving our ability to uh, characterize and test at higher throughputs, but also increasing our reproducibility. So even if you have that at speed, you need to make sure that it's reproducible. And so if you're manufacturing 100 um, objects, you need to make sure that 100 objects are useful and you're not having wastage and throwing 50 of those away. So it's that reproducibility we wanted to um, make sure we're addressing as well. But we do have specific target areas. So we did have additive manufacturing, even though it's been around for uh, a, uh, a few years now, isn't going away anywhere. And it's very, very important that we still invest in this area and it's a growing area still uh, globally and definitely we want to be in that, uh, a strong position in the UK. Um, so we had investment into different add additive manufacturing pieces of kit. We also had a focus on fibrous technologies. An example of that is just, just what I've shown with some of my research. You know, we are technically, you know, most of our tissues are, are fibrous tissues. And so fibrous scaffolds really are key in terms of addressing the tissue needs. And so, you know, whether or not that's a wound care product or whether or not that's a tissue engineering scaffold or new biomaterial that's going to be implanted, you know, the virus scaffolds is something that's that's growing as an area isn't going away as well. 
The point three that you can see here is bioelectronic systems. And this is an area in the UK where it's very fast moving. And we have some uh, a great deal of investment in terms of bioelectronics and, and what we can um, deliver and what we can assess. Um, and again, what we how we can characterize and test new bio, bioelectronic uh, devices. We also um, wanted to be able to, uh, as I said, um, have uh, faster um, testing bits of kits. And I'll give you an example uh, with the biomechanical suite um, shortly with, with how we've addressed that. And we also, the key things we're calling, coming up um, from our uh, landscape was minimally invasive tissue repairs. So most of our uh, clinicians, and we are very clinically led, um, tend to, uh, are moving towards minimally invasive surgery. So any new products we're developing, really, we have to move away from the open surgery technique and move towards invasive surgery delivery. So we need to be thinking about how we can do that. And then the last one there is smart materials for remote sensing and monitoring and e-health is, is again a very growing area. So these are the key um, parts of the landscape that we're um, working towards. And we wanted to invest not only in kits, but also in, in uh, as we're moving forward, we've bought some of the equipment now, which is coming online very shortly within the new building in Manchester. We're also going to be throughout 2021 having um, workshops around these different areas. So I won't go through each of those themes. So I just wanted to pick up on a couple of them. So the bioelectronics I mentioned earlier was um, a growing area. So you can see some examples here. This is one of our colleagues, um, Alex Casson at the University of Manchester, working in um, uh, sort of these conformable uh, tattoos and different EEG sensors that you can see here on the right hand side. So these conformable substrates that can be used to detect and have a very efficient uh, measurement and sensing of uh, different um, brain uh, brain activity uh, um, sensitivity and different um, e, sort of e health, different textile conductive substrates that can then be utilized within um, the sensor technology. So in, to in terms of the support through the Voice Institute, we now have um, uh, invested over a million uh, pounds. We have all of the kind of kit all together rather than spread out in different uh, buildings that makes it very difficult then to do the work. We have a new patch clamping um, system that's on site. We have a 36 channel plus potential stats with different um, uh, spectro uh, spectrography on, on the different channels that can be used. Again, users can come in and use this uh, these facilities. We have impedance analyzers and signal analyzers that we've purchased. And then we have a variety of different oscilloscopes and uh, multimeters and data acquisition cards that have been purchased through the platform that, again, SMEs and academics are welcome to come and, and, and use. The other um, format I wanted to show you in terms of investment, there's lots of investment, I just wanted to focus on a couple of these, is the uh, the nanofibers. So I talked about electrospinning in my own technology, but again, a lot of people are looking at fibre devices. And when we talk um, with our stakeholders, one of the issues is the, as I mentioned, the scale up, that acceleration, we need that acceleration through to translation. So you tend to have a research where you just have one a model where you're electrospinning, you just have one syringe needle producing um, a product, which is fine at the very early stages of research when you're changing lots of parameters. But when you want to scale up your um, uh, amount of material that you're going to be testing in order to get a, a, um, a sample number that's statistically relevant and then and, and publish and translate um, for usable data, really you've got to jump to industrial scale and that's far too expensive and not appropriate to to move forward so we needed something that was higher throughput from your normal initial research stage before you move to industrial stage a stage and that's not available or wasn't available in the uk um, um but it is now and uh, will be coming online through the voice institute so essentially um with uh, uh from bionicia we're working with a company to produce this roll-to-roll -roll electrospinning um, system. So now what would have taken you maybe um, four weeks to produce in terms of size of sample um, will now take you maybe a couple of days. So if somebody can, excuse me, somebody can come and um, uh, use the piece of kit. I don't know if you can see, but there's lots of little needles coming from here, hence the speed. Um, and we have a roll to roll, so we don't just have one, one mat. Um, that can be produced. The other th nice thing about this piece of kit is that we have in situ fibromatology. So normally what would happen is you 
um, manufacture your electrospon fiber. They're nanofibers, so they're very small. And normally you take the offline and you have to use electron microscopy or similar imaging technique to see whether or not your manufacturing process has been appropriate and you're actually getting fibers rather than kind of a beading um, uh, situation. Now, the metrology is online, so you'll be able to see the thickness. You'll be able to know the thickness um, of the uh, fibers as it's being produced. And so it will be a much quicker uh, process in terms of manufacture and uh, quality control. The last thing that's worth mentioning about this is that we're also having designed in, inside here a robotic system, which we already have working um, for automotive industry, but we're going to scale that down. So now rather than just being able to spin a mat, we'll be able to have a different collector system. So indeed, you can spin and move your collector system around and have um, you know 3D fibrous orientated hierarchical the structures that you can then manufacture with this um, a piece of kit, which I would have thought would be very attractive to uh, many of those on the call. And then the last piece of kit I wanted to tell you about was the biomechanical evaluation and analysis suite. We have spent a million pounds on um, these different types of bioreactors and mechanical testing. So we have two, for example, we have two of these four chamber um, uh, test instruments where we have lots of different tensile grips or compression grips for all different tissue types, whether or not it's a blood vessel or a piece of cartilage or a ligament that you're wanting to grow in um, culture medium. And obviously all of that sits inside an incubator. But rather than just having one sample, we have load cells. We have the eight different load cells and two other pieces of instruments. So you can have N equals 10 samples all running at the same time, rather than um, waiting, having to repeat that you know, 10 times and that will take 10 times as long. So again, please do come and, and have a look um, once you're able to, to get to Manchester and have the lab. Um, if you want to have a browse on the equipment catalogue, please do go to the uh, the web um, site. You can see just on the left hand side there, you can do it. You can do a search on the equipment itself on theme. But if you want to have a look across themes, so many of the other themes have um, useful kit that you might want to use to analyse or manufacture as well. You could look in the categories, you can look at design, make, modelling, sample prep, and you can do a selection that way and search just in case it's a bit of kit you haven't even known about that we've been able to purchase and support through the Royce that will be now available to you. As I mentioned, we have the Royce Hub, but we have many other partners. So some of these kits you can see might be, if you're based in London, might be more applicable to go to, such as Imperial, Leeds, Liverpool, as an example. So then uh, just lastly, I wanted to tell you about um, obviously the training. So I mentioned before, we're not just facilities. We do have other resources. Obviously, we have academic resources across all the different partners in the, um, uh, the partners within the Royce um, that I'd mentioned earlier. But we also have a lot of training. So we have student equipment access scheme. Um, so if you're a PhD in uh, another university, that's whether they're a partner or not, you, you're able to access the Royce. So please do uh, follow the link that I've shown you on the on the slide here, the student access. We also have um, small to medium enterprises. We have a scheme so um, you can access some of the equipment for short term projects. Um, please do get in touch with us. And obviously, as I mentioned before, we have not just about uh, facility access, we have workshops. So we have different event series and we'll be getting in contact with you soon um, about specific workshops around those different themes that I mentioned, such as bioelectronics, additive manufacture, fiber tech, um, scale up um, and, and see what we can do as a community to, to make sure the regulatory is fit for purpose. I've just got my last slide um, and just to, to thank all of you for uh, listening. Um, I'm very happy to take any questions or, and I'm looking forward to speaking to you all um, in the panel at the end of the um, uh, talk. Thanks, Sarah. That was a really great, um, insightful talk. What a way to start off the evening. Um, really great to hear about your work with integration and, and translation at the Henry Royce. That's two things that you know we're really passionate about in, in, at Innovation Forum. Um, and particularly, you know, lots of stuff in there that no doubt will be really relevant to the audience members watching today. Um, no doubt some of you watching will be involved with uh, biomedical uh, material SMEs. So lots to digest in that. And thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Um, delighted to announce the first of our three startup founder talks. Um, the first being by Professor Aileen Miller, CEO and Founding Director at Manchester Biogel. 
Uh, Aileen is a senior manager and strategic leader with over 20 years of experience leading commercial and academic R&D teams in the biomaterials sector. And she has a very strong track record of both raising funds and translating academic research into the commercial and clinical setting. So Aileen, please go ahead um, and thank you in advance. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction and uh, invitation to talk to everybody today. So a bit of a disclosure, as you can see <laughs> from my slides, um, I'm still professor uh, of uh, biomolecular engineering in Manchester University and uh, I'm CEO of our startup company, uh, Manchester Biogel, which I'll tell you a little bit about today. So I'm more than happy um, in the panel discussion at the end to talk about a bit more about our journey. Um, and this is uh, lockdown uh, 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 <laughs> interruptions. Um, but I want to can tell you a little bit more about our journey, some of the things that we think we did well, some of the things where uh, we didn't do so well, and some of the lessons that we've learned along the way. And we've done that by uh, uh, making mistakes. So it's always good learning opportunity. But what I wanted to do today is just tell you a little bit about Manchester Biogel, who we are and, and what we do. So we are a materials based company. Um, we make, manufacture and sell peptide hydrogels and those are used by our customers for 2D, 3D cell culture and also as bioinks for uh, 3D bioprinting. So it's a little bit about the follow on from the fibrous structure uh, materials that uh, Sarah was talking about earlier. So as a company, uh, we were established in uh, early 2014 and we are based at the ex AstraZeneca site, uh, Manaldale Park. Uh, this is us uh, in here now. Um, and we recently moved into uh, bigger labs. Um, uh, we moved from the cupboard that we were in when we originally started, um, but we got uh, some new fu funding and that allowed us to expand both our team and also our facilities. Um, we have nine full-time staff now. Um, uh, pretty much all scientists, but their last hire uh, was a marketing person. So we're starting to expand and diversify the team, which is really exciting. Um, as you'll have realised, the research originated in Manchester. It, uh, it's a culmination of probably about 16, 18 years worth of research that myself and uh, my co-founder uh, developed over that time in Manchester. And I'll tell you a little bit about that later on. The nice thing about the company is that we do a lot of collaborations um, and that's one thing that I really pushed as uh, the company to do um, and that's helping uh, product development and helping exemplify the use of our materials as well. So we've got at the moment 11 PhD case awards um, across the UK from uh, Glasgow, Manchester, uh, Bath, UCL, uh, Liverpool and also Dublin. Um, and we've got a couple of Innovate grants. We've got one uh, KTP with Imperial College and we've got a small sustainability uh, award uh, with two other companies, which is actually really exciting. And that's it's focused on product development. We've also got a couple of other smaller uh, collaborative grants as well. So that's kind of who we are. Uh, what is the challenge area that we are focusing on? So with businesses, as you'll as you, as you know, it's not about sort of the fancy science that you can do. It's actually about the solution to the problems that people are having. So what problems are people having? I thought it would be useful just to try to highlight this to set our materials and our products into context. So as Sarah was talking about, biomaterials, uh, 2D, 3D cell culture, the current market leader uh, in this area as a scaffold for 3D cell culture is Matrigel. It's a tumor uh, that's put inside uh, mice. The tumor is grown, the mice are then sacrificed, uh, the tumor extracted, decellularized and sold as Matrigel. Um, so it takes three mice uh, to, to make every 10 mils uh, roughly of product and to meet today's current market demand, uh, which is about 70% of the market share worth about 530 million. Um, it's, you need about 3 million mice uh, to make mate gel. So it's not a, a, an ethical product. But actually, because it's also animal derived, it's got a huge batch to batch variability. Um, so uh, you, you can't control um, the, the, the properties of the material or the chemical content of the material. It's got a whole soup of growth factors in there that actually you don't, people don't know exactly what's in there. So when you do cell culture, you don't know exactly uh, why you're getting the responses you are for the cell behavior. So animal derived, you can't be used, can't translate it into the clinic because it's an animal product. Huge batch to batch variability, don't know the composition. It's also not tunable, so you can't change uh, anything about it in terms of the mechanical strength or the functionality. 
It's also a bit of a faff, uh, it's a very technical term, uh, to use um, because you've got to keep it on ice, bring it up to room temperature uh, and back and forth. Um, we also looked at uh, the community. So um, trying to understand the issues that uh, people were having. So 90% of the R&D community that do this type of work um, are not satisfied uh, with MHL, even though they're currently using it. And this is a quote that came back to us uh, from somebody, uh, a professor at Imperial College. They said, everyone uses MHL, everyone hates it. We need a synthetic alternative and we need it now. And I think that really sums up the feeling in the community when you go out to talk to them. So this is where our uh, peptide hydrogels come into play. So on the next slide, I'll show you sort of the background into the materials um, and how we have developed our research into making uh, something that's sort of commercially uh, viable. Um, so hopefully this video will show, but our materials this summarise is about 18 years worth of work uh, and many PhD students, but we, we take the amino acids uh, that are out there in nature that make up proteins. The amino acids are all different in terms of charged, non-charged, hydrophilic, hydrophobic. So we combine them in specific ways um, and design them so that they will align one on top of each other into these sort of beta sheet fibre structures. And then, of course, those fibres then uh, entangle just like spaghetti on a plate to form this fibrillar network, which is essentially like a climbing frame for cells to go into, grab onto, move around and be instructed to do specific things. So we use those to make those uh, uh, self-supporting hydrogels um, for uh, scaffolds for the, the cell culture. The nice thing about our systems is because they're fully synthetic and tunable, we can actually replicate the stiffness and the functionality of pretty much all human uh, tissues. So I kind of touched upon the USPs, when you think about commercialising something, you need to think, well, how, how do you differentiate yourselves uh, from, from the competition out there? So we believe with several of these, not only can we uh, tune the materials uh, to replicate all human tissues because they're animal free. Um, uh, we make them in the lab so you can get batch to batch uh, reproducibility uh, and in a scalable way in terms of uh, making millilitres through to litres and beyond. So we can get reproducible uh, materials and that allows people to get reproducible and reliable results. So we're solving that problem uh, for them with our materials. Because our materials are made from biological building blocks, uh, they're fully biocompatible, so they can actually be translated into clinical applications, and we have several projects ongoing in, in that area. Um, we supply our materials ready to use, uh, and this was part of our learning journey. Uh, when we first started, we were giving people powders, um, and then we're giving them a recipe to make the hydrogels themselves, but they didn't get, uh, uh, no two people could make the same gel. So we actually then, Take the, just took the decision to supply our materials ready to use. Um, so you just simply add your cells, uh, plate them, and then you start going to get your results. Nice and nice, straightforward and easy. Um, as you might have seen uh, at the end of that video, the materials are fully transparent. So they're compatible with uh, uh, various microscopy uh, techniques. So you can actually image and see uh, your cells and find out what, exactly what they're doing. And the nice thing about the hydrogels is that they're shear thinning which means they're actually printable, uh, injectable and sprayable. So you can use them as inks for 3D printing and uh, you can also inject them and spray them uh, directly uh, for in vivo uh, uh, clinical translatable applications. So what do we actually sell? So we have a, a range of products, uh, peptogels, uh, so it's our peptide hydrogels. Um, we have a range of different hydrogels that we're using for 3D cell culture. And we also have peptide inks sold in the cartridges um, uh, with food colouring in them, just so you can see, see the hydrogels. Um, but these are used uh, uh, and sold for, for bioprinting uh, applications. So what kind of gels and inks do we have? We have a range of different gels because every cell likes something a little bit different in terms of whether it's mechanical stiffness or whether it's maybe charge uh, within the, the scaffold system. So we have a starter pack, which is a range of five different gels to work out which scaffold is the most suitable for your cell's needs. And um, so we always uh, suggest people start with this to get a feel uh, for handle on how the hydrogels actually work. We also have mechanical kits. Um, so, as I said, we can tune the stiffness, so we can go all the way from breast or, or brain tumor, uh, brain uh, uh, muscle stiffness through lung to muscle uh, uh, and beyond. Um, and we can tune that stiffness and we have mechanical kits where we have various uh, uh, stiffnesses of materials to test 
which mechanical stiffness is right for your cell's needs. And sometimes people want to look at the mechanical stimulus uh, on, on their uh, cell's behavior as well. And the mechanical kits are perfect uh, to, to explore uh, that side of the uh, sample range. We also have a range of functional kits. So we can introduce uh, uh, peptide ligands into the ends of the peptide. So we've got some examples you can see here. So we can introduce effectively sort of fibronectin, uh, laminin, or actually collagen, which isn't there, uh, uh, peptide sequences to help direct uh, cell behavior. Um, laminin is very popular for stem cells, for example. We can also introduce other types of things into, into the systems, uh, uh, fluorescently labeled systems. So you can actually image your hydrogel when you put it in vivo, for example. Laminin uh, to try to really uh, uh, direct cell behavior. So just some examples um, of what happens when you introduce cell functionality. So the top image on the left, you've got sort of a plain vanilla. So a, and there's no functionality, vanilla uh, hydrogels as I call them. And on the right hand, you've got uh, a fibroblasts cultured when you've got RGD present. So the cells um, uh, stay al al alive um, within the vanilla hydrogels, but you just get expedited growth essentially when you've got the RGD for fibroblasts, which like to adhere onto the surface and then spread into their spindle-like uh, morphology. The bottom is an example of uh, introducing full laminin into a system. So here we've got uh, our, one of our alpha-1 hydrogels and we've got induced pluripotent stem cells. And when you introduce laminin into the system, it's actually just encouraging the, uh, the iPSCs to uh, spread and grow uh, throughout the 3D matrix. So it's just a couple of examples uh, there. So in terms of applications, um, We've got a whole range of uh, different applications and I've got a whole number of case studies that I could talk through, but uh, um, uh, I don't have time. But I just wanted to highlight sort of the breadth of application space that we have available to us. So it ranges from tissue engineering, regenerative medicine through sort of bioprinting high throughput screening for uh, organoid growth for uh, 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 drug discovery applications through cancer, uh, through the growth of stem cells and organoids. So just to show you some uh, uh, image images, um, we can print 3D structures. We've actually gone up as high as one centimeter, uh, printing uh, structures and printing cells with them now. So this is this was an example of breast epithelial cells um, uh, from Marco Domingos's group. And here uh, we're looking at using different robotic techniques. This is a formulatrix uh, printing high throughput system where we can get micro droplets down to one microliter. Uh, um, printed reproducibly and this is aiming then for high throughput type applications. Looking towards cancer, uh, so this is an example uh, that has come from uh, Imperial College uh, where we've looked at independently varying the stiffness of the hydrogel and the pH and uh, they tell us that ours is one of the few materials or the only material actually where you can independently vary each of those parameters and of course by varying the stiffness and the pH then you're able to mimic healthy tissue versus uh, 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 tumour tissue but tumour tissue at different stages of the disease as well so you can actually look at the impact of the surrounding tissue the hydrogel has on the development and the progression of the of the, of the tumor um, and what they're looking at is actually the cell biological pathways and they're identifying different proteins that are being expressed due to the influence of the surroundings and of course that's key because that's the mechanism that the therapeutics and the chemotherapy agents uh, drugs actually work uh, and are targeting different cell biological pathways so they're finding that it changes uh, depending on the age of the tumor and of course then that tells you at which stage which therapy is going to be appropriate and why and that's going to come out hopefully um what's been submitted to nature. Well, let's, let, let's see what happens in that space. Um, it's also used for stem cells and organoid growth. And these are some examples here. So in the top, we've got some kidney organoids grown within alpha-4. And here we've got some liver organoids. And that's just showing that you're expressing um, the right markers uh, to get the right phenotype behavior uh, of, uh, of your organoid uh, uh, systems here. And then those are going to be used uh, for drug discovery uh, applications. Um, tissue engineering, this is an example from Manchester from Julie Goff's group. And this is looking at co-culture where we've got fibroblasts in 3D and epithelial cells on the top layer. Um, and uh, you can see that the cells are, are, are behaving nicely and they're putting down the matrix and they're forming a nice epithelial layer. And that's looking at uh, tissue generation for uh, the treatment of Barrett's esophagus. Um, which is your th inside uh, of your throat. Um, and then 
Uh, another example is wound healing. So this is looking at uh, uh, wound repair. So here we've got keratinocytes uh, in the hydrogels. They've been, uh, we've got a skin model that has uh, had an artificial cut in it. We sprayed the hydrogel with the keratinocytes into the wound site and then you can see that it's, it's, it's starting to repair uh, nicely. So that project is ongoing um, uh, through Portsmouth. And then this is one of our recent examples and um, this uh, is gone into uh, looking at regenerative medicine um, looking at the repair of fistulas in the anus. So it's a big issue in terms of scar formation uh, and it, it's very uncomfortable, uh, uh, I believe, for um, uh, uh, human uh, 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 people who develop these types of complications. So what is needed is instead of uh, when a fistula forms, they need to re um, uh, uh, epithelialize the system rather than having scar formation, which then becomes very rigid and stiff. So what we've done here, this, this study is where uh, we've taken the hydrogel, we've uh, uh, worked with Carillium, uh, based in company, we've got their own uh, uh, stem cell lineages, um, so we've incorporated th their stem cells and they've been injected into pigs. It's maybe not the best picture actually, um, but it's been injected into pigs in January and uh, we'll find out the results of those studies uh, in mid-April when uh, the pigs are sacrificed and we actually have a look to see how the fistulas have repaired in, in comparison to the controls. So it's a really just a quick snapshot with a few images thrown at a slide, but it just I wanted to give you an idea of the breadth uh, of the types of applications that you can use um, with the hydrogels and we're always looking for new application areas, new collaborations um, and new directions uh, of study as well as progressing uh, current ones. So really I just wanted to give you the idea that uh, the hydrogels are, are a versatile platform um, that open the door for a variety of 3D cell culture uh, systems um, either in vitro in the plate, either high throughput or, or uh, 3D bioprinting. And with that, I want to just finish. Uh, happy to answer questions about the company, our journey. Uh, as I said at the beginning, and please uh, give us a follow on social media um, to say hi and to keep up to date um, with uh, uh, news and, and exciting things from our, our site. And thank you very much for listening and I look forward to talking to you later. Thanks, Aileen. Uh, that was fantastic. Uh, please do post your comments for Aileen and all of our speakers in the chat bar um, to the right of the main stage. Uh, fantastic talk. Thank you so much. Um, certainly, there seems to be a massive uh, validated unmet need. Three million mice for such a small amount of product seems completely crazy. Um, and I do love the term vanilla hydrogel. I'll be using that in the future. Uh, that's great. Thank you. That's all for our first um, startup founder pitch. Here we are now with our not uh, the least, but the last of our keynote um, startup founder talks delivered by Dr. Chris Bullock, a longtime friend of the Innovation Forum, actually, uh, but more importantly, CEO and co-founder at QV Bioelectronics. Um, Chris has a PhD in regenerative medicine from the University of Manchester, uh, focusing around the development of novel graphene bioelectronic devices and the use of electrical stimuli to control cell behavior. He now acts as the managing director of QV Bioelectronics and oversees the business and technical development aims of the company. So Chris, please go ahead um, and keep me updated and I will change the presentation when you ask. Thanks, Gemma. Uh, slide, please. Uh, so I'd like to start with a question. If you or a loved one was going to die, how would you measure the value of the remaining time that you had left together? Sadly, in oncology, this is a very real and challenging question and one that is faced by many families uh, every day. Slide, please. And this is especially true in the case of the most common uh, brain tumor, glioblastoma, which sadly has no cure. And even with the uh, highly intensive current treatment process, which consists of surgical removal of the tumor, followed by chemotherapy and radiotherapy, patient survival is limited to just over a year on average after their first diagnosis. And the reason for this is the surgery uh, unavoidably leaves behind residual cancer cells in the surrounding brain tissue uh, that are resistant to chemotherapy and radiotherapy. 
And over time, those residual cells uh, aggressively form new tumours that sadly lead to the death of the patient. Slide, please. Fortunately, there are new electrotherapy approaches of treating these cancer cells. Um, and this is a technique that is now on the market with approval by the FDA, EMA, and other major regulatory agencies. Um, and what it involves is applying electric fields at specific frequencies to the residual cancer cells. And these interfere with cancer cell division, slowing tumor growth and prolonging patient survival. The, uh, there is a, a device already on the market that uh, uses this mechanism, and it's been able to demonstrate approximately a 50% survival benefit, which is an enormous step forwards in a cancer that the last you know, major breakthroughs were 20 years ago. Slide, please. But what, one thing that's come out of that, that clinical data is it's very clear that this is a technique that requires constant dosing. So there, there doesn't seem to be a particularly long lasting effect of the electrotherapy. And what that means is that the longer each day patients are undergoing electrotherapy, the more effective their treatment is. And what you find is the existing technology, patients are recommended to use it for 18 hours a day, but fewer, fewer than 10% of patients actually achieve that, that figure. And that has a, a very real impact on how effective their treatment is. Slide, please. But when you see what patients have to go through every single day, it's, it's no surprise, really. Um, the, the cumbersome external design of this device has an enormous impact on patient quality of life. And it's very understandable as to why people are not uh, using this all day, every day, uh, particularly in the later phases of their life when other things might be more important to them. Slide, please. Having said that, the, the company behind that technology called uh, Novacure have been enormously successful. Uh, their market cap on, on NASDAQ is, is currently in excess of 17 billion US, uh, and they're making just, just uh, short of $500 million a year in revenues. And that's from treating actually a very small percentage of patients. Uh, almost all of their patients are in the United States, and it's accounting for fewer than 20% of the glioblastoma population. So you can see that there is an enormous uh, market opportunity here that they have essentially validated for us. Um, and there's a clear need for better technology that doesn't force this disconnect between uh, patient quality of life and the efficacy of their, their treatment. Slide, please. And that's where we at QV Bioelectronics uh, step in. So we're developing an implanted electrotherapy device that sits within the surgical cavity left behind by the existing tumor removal surgery. From there, it delivers therapy continuously and, and focally to the tumor resection margins, which is where those residual uh, cancer cells lie. Because the device is entirely implanted within the body, it overcomes those quality of life issues associated with the existing technology. Um, and slide, please. And because we can deliver the treatment continuously, uh, we can expect to uh, offer significantly improved outcomes of, of the treatment. Um, indeed, we are. Uh, our estimates are that we will be able to double the life expectancy of these patients uh, compared to that that they currently experience in the NHS. Slide, please. And uh, the point I was trying to make here was um, that everything that we're doing is really uh, got foundations in existing clinical practice. So firstly, there's the, the clear predicate technology of, of the existing electrotherapy. Um, but also, you know, there's there's decades of clinical experience uh, with implanted electronic devices of this type. Uh, one of the 
it, the most um, obvious comparisons for our case is deep brain stimulation, which is a relatively common treatment for Parkinson's tremor. Um, but there's other techniques as well, which really means that everything that we are doing uh, has a, a foundation in existing clinical practice. Slide, please. And we, we've touched briefly on uh, regulation uh, earlier today and and indeed one of the one of the, the comments I saw in the in the, the title page for, for this event was around the regulatory barriers for uh, advanced materials um, it probably won't surprise you to find out that uh, long-term implantation of, of medical devices into the brain is is meeting almost stereotypically the the highest uh, regulatory burden for, for medical devices were a, a class three device um, and that means that there's very stringent regulation that we have to follow in the design and development of this technology and quite rightly so to be honest uh, slide please and here I, I just wanted to give you a flavor of, of where we are in our journey so um, we're just in the process now of completing a 750,000 pound uh, seed raise um, and that's really going to uh, take us through to the end of next year uh, and allow us to run a test in a large animal um, and we'll then be looking for for more money uh, to go out and run a first in man clinical trial uh, which we have scheduled uh, for 2024. Uh, I think um, Part of, of the message that I wanted to, to give, convey from this slide um, for anyone in the audience who is thinking about going out and doing similar things is firstly, the, the timescales, you know, company is, is two years old and uh, we've got a, a 10 year window on that basis for us to, to get on the market and really start to be able to sell our devices. But that is par for the course for uh, implanted medical devices and uh, where a lot of the advanced biomaterials uh, clinically uh, will be used. Um, and the other thing is, is the sums of money involved. Um, you can see the very large amount of investment that we, we need to raise to, to make it all the way through those clinical, uh, clinical trials. It's a, a very expensive process. Um, but it's not impossible and you can see firstly from the, the case of Novacule that I, I kind of mentioned earlier but some of the other uh, companies on the, the slides there that um, you know investors are willing to to back these kind of companies because uh, the commercial opportunity uh, can be very big as well um, so in our, in our case uh, for glioblastoma alone um, we think it's uh, an over three billion pound uh, market for, for the top ten uh, territories around the world. Uh, slide please. And I, I just wanted to finish off by, by talking uh, a little bit about how biomaterials uh, fit into that that process because ultimately that's that's why we're here today. Um, so firstly in our case we have to form a, a tight electrical contact with uh, the interior walls of this this surgical cavity um, to deliver stimulation in, in three dimensions. And that in itself is a challenge because these are not even geometries. Um, patients have tumors in, in different locations of the brain and, and they're different sizes from, from patient to patient. Um, and the surgeons won't know the exact dimensions of that cavity until they've actually been in and removed the tumor. So what we have is, is technology that allows our device to rapidly conform within the operating theater to fit each individual patient and allow that process to take place. There's also a need for no adverse biological reactions in, in either the, the, the short term or, or the very long term uh, for our device. Um, and we also need the, the implant. Essentially, it's going to be life sustaining to be functional throughout the lifetime of the patient. And the hope is that for some patients, you know, we might be talking about in excess of 10 years uh, in this case. And uh, from a material science uh, challenge, that, that is uh, another challenging area, um, as I'm, I'm sure Sarah would also have some experience when you're applying uh, an electric field to biomaterials, you can greatly accelerate some of the uh, degradation processes that can take place. And a, and a final point is the, the need for MRI compatibility. Um, and 
you know, MRI compatibility can kind of take two forms. Uh, if you were using a, a ferrous metal, um, say a certain types of stainless steel, um, and you, you implant that into a patient and they have an MRI scan, then you can essentially superheat their implant, burn them very badly, and potentially pull it around with the magnets as well. So clearly that's something we need to avoid. But there's also a kind of a, a second level of compatibility, which is uh, to do with interfering with imaging. And in our case, this is a very important challenge because MRI imaging is the way that the clinicians um, follow up these patients to see what is going on with their tumors. So uh, by uh, ensuring that our implants are MRI compatible, we, we fit nicely into the existing tumor, uh, clinical pathway. And we achieve that uh, using advanced materials, uh, in our case, uh, conductive polymers and also some, some graphene based materials as well. And uh, I'll just finish uh, by by saying that I had a, a comment from from uh, an investor recently who was kind of suggesting, well, all you're doing is sticking some electronics in the brain. Uh, how complicated can that be? Because it's based on existing technology. And I think um, with this slide, I was just uh, trying to convey some of that complexity and, and where the real science in this company lies. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and and really that's that's it. If you can go to the next slide, uh, Jenna, um, we've got our um, our website and, and socials there. And um, if anyone's interested in uh, keeping an eye on what we're doing, um, please do give us a follow. Um, but thanks very much. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Uh, that, uh, that was really truly excellent. excellent. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for staying with us and sticking it out until the end. Um, appreciate that. We've now reached the final segment of this evening's webinar. Um, we were due to have a panel um, officially moderated by Professor Paul Townsend. However, unfortunately, um, that's not been possible as he hasn't been able to attend. Therefore, we'll be moving to more of a Q&A style um, panel discussion whereby I will be reading um, your most burning questions from the chat uh, to our speakers today. Please feel free to continue to add questions into that chat box. I'll pick them up um, as and when I can and address, um, address the speakers with them. So just to start, um, one that I can see from Nazir. Um, to the panel, I think probably most relevant to, uh, to Chris and Aileen, but Aravind and Sarah, please feel free to jump in also. Um, what do you think are the biggest challenges for new ventures and or startups to enter the advanced material space, both in terms of the UK environment and also globally? Do you want to go first, Aileen? Uh, yeah, I can, I, can, I can give it a go. Um, I think you always think that money is normally the the, the key uh, stumbling block, but actually, I, I mean, it's important and it's not easy to come by, but I don't think it's the biggest hurdle. I think actually having the right team uh, in the company is is actually one of the key uh, uh, criteria for success. And it's, it's, it's the team that understands the technology, but actually what's most important, I think, is understanding the problem that you're addressing um, and, and uh, actually that there is a market for the technology that you have and it's identifying that and being uh, smart enough to identify that early on um, and actually putting your you know putting your academic ego to one side it doesn't matter how fancy the science is or how clever the science is actually nobody really cares they just want to know that you can solve that their problem and if there is a problem uh, that you identify uh, and you can address it then then that's actually i think the biggest challenge and then it's getting the team and all the other building blocks in place to go along along that journey um and i've actually forgotten what the question was <laughs> uh, challenges um so yeah i think getting the right team and getting the right team in place that stay with you for the journey i, I think is one of the key the key issues um, I'll let Chris come in and then I'll have a think about some some other issues. Yeah. Um, well, I, I completely agree with with what Aileen said, although I, I would probably say that those things are 
are true of any startup. You know, uh, a, a lot of startup companies end up building things that fundamentally people don't want to buy, and that means you haven't got a business. Um, and it's also true that, particularly in early stage companies, well, I think in, in a company of any stage, that there's a lot of work to be done, um, and there's no way that one person can, can shoulder all of that. So that's that's where having the right team uh, really comes into it. And that's not just about skill set, that's also about um, culture, kind of mindset, um, fit within the, the kind of goals uh, of the of the company um but i will go back to to one thing that uh, aileen said wasn't important at the start uh, of of money um and you know it, it's true for any startup that um bringing money in uh, primarily I'm, I'm talking about investment um is is important to, to get started in specifically in the advanced material space um it's very important because typically you're your startup costs are a lot higher. You know, we're not talking about app development here. Materials science is, is expensive. Um, and quite often, particularly with, with the, the, the deep tech um, technologies, as, as they're often called, um, you've got really long timescales um, between, you know, developing your, your, your technology and maybe that's been incubated in, in, a, in a university for a few years um, and actually starting to, to make serious uh, revenue off of it, um, which will then support your your future growth, um, and that some those kind of long timescales are are something that that can put off um, your everyday investors, if you like, and it, it means that you typically have to work with with more specialist uh, investors. And Aravind, you've actually started not one but two uh, startups companies does this align with with your view of your journey so far with both the graphene and atomic mechanics well the only thing i would add to what uh, alid and chris have said is is in a sense the two are related because an investor will not invest just in the technology they are also looking at the people they also invest in the people so for example with my with, with atomic mechanics if I had decided to start Atomic Mechanics without uh, the people like Chris and Daniel who actually did the work in my lab, it wouldn't have gotten anywhere because the investors are not just looking for how good is the technology, but they want to know if the people who have come up with it, the real brains behind it, the students who have been in the lab day in and day out developing this are on board. So I think having the right people is also key to being able to attract investment. So you need to get both of those ducks in a row. Yeah, just 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 to add to that, I think um, one of the investors said to me just a couple of weeks ago, uh, as we were thinking about going for Series A funding in about 12, 18 months time, is technology, team and traction, uh, the three Ts. So thinking along that theme of um, innovative technologies and um, entrepreneurship, broadly to the panel, um, and I would particularly bring in Sarah to answer this question also, what are the really exciting frontiers in biomaterials, advanced materials, um, and this sector? You know, what are the most exciting novel technologies hitting this space right now? Well, I, I think we've seen some excellent examples of them today, to be honest. Like, you know, we, we did, uh, as I mentioned, the, the landscaping document within the uh, Royce and, and bioelectronics is, is one of the key fast growing areas. And you can see the, the changes in technology, um, you know, month to month, really, and in terms of the publications that's coming out, the research that's, that's been performed. So it's this is a, a really fast growing area. Most of us are aware of additive manufacture, for example, already. Like I said before, it's, that's not going away and it's important, but I think it's it's how we can use that existing technology into, into new innovations and, and translating that through. Any thoughts from the rest of the panel? Obviously, Chris, Aileen and, and Aravind, you all have a vested interest to say <laughs> one thing. Yeah, I completely uh, agree with Sarah. Bioelectronics of the future. Everyone should be uh, should be uh, putting their money in. Um, I, I, I mean, the way I'd look at it is, you know, real advancement uh, in any form of technology is typically limited or, or allowed to progress by the hardware available, and and that's really where material science comes in. Um, so 
you know, it, it, we're talking about healthcare tonight, but this is equally uh, applicable to something like computing where, you know, we're reaching the, the limit of what, of how small a, a microchip can be and therefore how, how much kind of processor speed you can get into a certain area. Um, and really there needs to be a, a step change in, in how the architecture works in, in kind of quantum computing to allow that next next phase of development. And I, I think in in kind of the last, I'm gonna say about 10 years, we're, we're starting to see um, a bit more of that, that kind of mindset change in, in biomaterials. Um, you know, I think about 10 years ago, a lot of the focus was, was really on, you know, if you want to, I, I work on implantable, so I have a, a certain perspective on this but uh if you want to implant a, a medical device in the body then you're you're aiming for something that's completely passive that you know isn't going to cause a, a reaction uh, um and, and and therefore will be safe but actually true functionality and, and improving outcomes and performance of technologies is, is actually more about uh uh, having an active uh, interface with the body and and that enabling some sort of you know two-way feedback between your your implant and, and the body that then enables the the additional functionality and I think that kind of mindset driven by by lots of things you know developments in in nanotechnology in um, in biochemistry you know and understanding how how the the cells and the body responds to uh, to um to materials um and of course you know we've heard a few examples about um tissue engineering and, and regenerative medicine tonight as well which is really underpinned by the the developments in, in stem cell biology um but, but that's really where i see that kind of similar step change in in biomaterials uh, taking place at the moment well my uh, work is probably a bit easier on this front than what the other three of you are doing because I'm not trying to stick anything into anybody, which makes life a lot easier. Uh, but yes, I think bioelectronics, this this interface between uh, multifunctional electronics and the human body, the human body is, is one big electronic system, right? You've got all the components from sensors to the central processing unit and, and the cooling system. It, it's basically one gigantic computer a controlled robot is what it is. So when you're trying to interface that with with your man-made electronics, and that's really advanced materials is is what that's all about. It's that it's that interface. At least for me, that that's the really exciting part. Whether it is uh, you know uh, the sort of stuff that I was talking about today, or whether it's biomedical assays uh, and things like that as well. I think it's it's really really exciting. The bioelectronics is uh, there's a huge future in that whether whether or not it's going inside the body i think it's really interesting mm -hmm. Fantastic. yeah i do think just just you know to, to add to that i think um developing uh that the electronic bioelectronic bio interface uh, in in response developing diagnostics um so you know you're really detecting the disease early uh, and then detecting it and uh sensing which therapeutics are going to work for an individual so it's that diagnostics leading to personalized precision medicine um, i think has got a big future which then you know it builds in all aspects of the uh, advanced by uh, advanced materials so we've spoken a little about some of the frontiers in the space and the really exciting areas of innovation um but what about you know the really painful bottlenecks in the industry chris spoke a bit about the regulatory aspect of his journey so far um aileen i know that um no doubt you will have had to have done some validation studies you know comparing going from um the original gel product to the synthetic gel and, and showing that it has the same efficacy there so i mean i just spitballing ideas here obviously you guys are the experts but in terms of you know the the bottlenecks in in general terms or according to your own experiences what have been the most frustrating um and and what really remain in the sector for you um just trying to think really in terms of 
us and as a sort of personally i think the first bottleneck was actually um transferring you know making a hydrogel on the one milliliter scale in the lab and actually making it you know in the hundred mils or a larger scale um a sort of in more manufacturing uh quality levels so it's introducing the scale up plus also the, the quality control um that 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 was a bottleneck for us for a while um, and then once we got that sorted, then 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 it was bringing in the, the, the appropriate team, and now we're we're at the stage where we're introducing ISO standardisation. Um, so we've got our quality management systems, and and uh, everything has to be documented um, in terms of everything you take out the fridge to everything that you uh, even play around with for R and D. And as an as a sort of an academic researcher, it's still quite alien to me that we've got to absolutely categorically write everything down. And when something goes wrong, we've got to put non-compliance in. So from personally, that's quite a bottleneck. Um, but we've got a couple of people in the company that that's normal for, um, or that they like that kind of thing. Um, but we're quite lucky in terms of in one aspect. We, we're just a, a, an R&D commodity um, consumables business. But to go into the actual um, clinical translation, we're working uh, uh, probably not quite as complex as Chris's route uh, into medical device, but we're looking at CAT2 med medical device. So we're working towards ISO 13485, then get CE mark or the equivalent of whatever it's, what's going to be after the Brexit um, uh, negotiations come in. So for us, scale up and then actually building the right team. Along the way, we we just we were talking about investors and investment and, and, and things like that. I think we made the mistake sort of part way through our journey of of uh, almost running out of money and saying yes to someone that that was going to give us money, and we probably should have done a bit more due diligence and um, before saying yes because it, it cost us probably a good nine nine months of time because we took on board the wrong investor who didn't understand like that. Um, so there was there was a bit of learning. Uh, learning to be done. They don't always take, say yes to someone that, that, that gives you, offers you some money. That's interesting because um, Chris and Aravind, you're at different stages of your respective fundraising journeys at the moment. Um, any experiences to share uh, with the audience of what that's been like so far? Um, well, the big challenge for me was uh, the fact that neither me nor my PhD students know the first thing about starting or running a business. Uh, so we're, you know, three scientists who decided there's some legs for what we're doing in various applications. And uh, we decided to start a business, but we and we didn't have the money to hire anybody who actually knew anything about running a business either. So it's been a really, really steep learning curve. And, and I'm sure everybody else in, in the panel will have gone through those same birthing pains that that we all went through so we're still in we're still in that learning stage i think and that's that's for me at least the most painful part because on top of everything else i have to do in my day job that i have to go home and do all of these things in the evening uh, to try and learn how to put together a balance sheet it's just it's not it's not fun but you know hopefully it'll pay dividends in the end but it's 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 that uh, it, it's the fact that we all, as academics, have full-time jobs, and then we have to do this on top of that, which which has been a really, really difficult uh, thing to to get around. Yeah, I mean, uh, I have no idea how how Arafin does it because, uh, as he says, it, it is incredibly hard work. Um, and if you're if you're working more than one job, I I, I can see how that's a, a real challenge. Um, I mean, your specific question, Gemma, I think was, you know, challenges in, in fundraising. Uh, we've had a similar story to, to Aileen, uh, you know, uh, an investor who kind of played us along a little bit um, and probably ended up costing us quite a few months uh, in the end. Um, and, you know, that is sadly not uncommon. Um, but it, I mean, frankly, raising investment is, is all about doing the hard yards. Uh, I think um, we have contacted one way or another. So, I mean, we've just completed our seed raise now, but I think we've spoken to in excess of 300 investors 
uh, in the UK and abroad. Um, and, you know, each one of those is, is essentially a learning experience. You know, they'll, they'll find something um, something wrong with the plan and you, you've then got to go and, and fix it, change the way you're presenting things and, and so on. So um, it's it's kind of an iterative uh, learning process, um, but eventually you, you start to, to get the right answers. Well, actually, I think just what I added, I think it's it's more than just iterative because Chris is simplifying it because you go and you change something and you go to another investor and they say, oh, why did you do it the way you were originally doing it? So it's it's not like every time you change something, it gets better for everybody concerned. You just keep running from pillar to post. It's very much a, a lottery. At some point, you have the right deck for the right investor for the right amount of money for the right tech if everything like has to fall into place and then they have to actually be like alin was saying somebody who actually understands your goals and who actually is going to bring some value to your business and not be a dead weight so 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 many things have to fall in place we got dragged along by an investor for nine months or so as well and, and that didn't go anywhere at the end so it's it, it's just it's it's a painful painful process and uh just have to persevere with it if you're if you're if you think there is value in what you're doing that can really go somewhere you just have to stick with it and go through the pains and hopefully you know uh, we're all at different stages but Eileen has probably been the most successful of, of the four of us around the table right now so uh, maybe she'll say that it has been worth it I don't know I'll give some words of wisdom to you later maybe <laughs> Yeah, I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah. Sarah, yes. Yeah. I just, I'll just comment on that from an academic perspective because obviously a lot of, you know, with, with the work that I've been doing, we've been not wanting to start our own spin-off, but actually to translate that and license that to another company. And the challenges for, for myself are the two main ones. One of them, I think Aaron's already mentioned that as acad academics, we've got a, a day job, right? So we've got our teaching and we've got our, our research, but actually at the metrics that we're judged by as academics, Yes, it could be that impact, but that takes so much longer to get. It's normally publications and it's grant funding and all of that takes time to to, to uh, come to fruition as well. So but they're, they're kind of quicker wins. And so really you end up having a choice between publishing early and not translating your work or waiting probably what could be a few years really and actually then getting the patent and then taking it through. And so when you look statistically within within the universities, how many people, even though they're coming up with great ideas and things that can be applied, so only 10% of those researchers are actually involved with translation. And obviously, as, as the university, as leads in the university, but also funding councils, we're trying to promote that to be a much higher percentage. But one of the things is, is, is kind of how we judged ourselves in our careers, which is these metrics that I mentioned. One of them is finding time to do it because all of it takes time and the other one I think Ivan already touched on is, is knowing kind of who to go to. So in my case, it was difficult setting up everything we needed for the clinical trial because I haven't done it before. Um, and most, of, particularly because I'm in a science and engineering faculty, most people in my faculty haven't really done that before because that's not what we do. And so, we, we, you know, we're trying to address that more, not only just with what we're doing in, in the voice and the connections and networks and the workshops we've got there, but also with new institutes, the Pinecoast Institute that we've started at Manchester to try and bridge that gap between, you know, final, you know, in the clinic and actually moving it forward through those technology readiness levels. That is fascinating to hear. Um, and, you know, just further reinforces and compounds the need for initiatives like the Pinecoast and the Henry Royce, uh, which really foster those, those collaborations and that spirit of translation. So great to hear. Um, in the interest of time, I know that we have a couple of speaker-specific questions in the chat. Um, so I think let's address these. Um, Sarah, the first one is for you um, from Matt Graham. Uh, when making your tendon scaffolds, what technique do you use to turn the fibers into yarns and how do you then twist those yarns? Secondly, is the device implanted in vivo with or without cells? So I'll answer the second bit first because it's quicker. It's an acellular product, so it does not have cells implanted in. We have been looking at tissue engineered options, um, but obviously the regulatory pathway is so much harder to come through and, and so much longer. So there's a potential there, but we wanted a simple and um, easier to translate acellular product. Um, in terms of turning our, our fibres into, into the yarns, we have initially, it was a few years ago, it was by hand and we tested it and see if we could do, but obviously we have an automated process now. So we, we have a line fibres, we collect those on the mandrel and then we cut a, we spent quite a long time 
um, quantifying the, the correct width of strip, we need to, we have a strip of the electrospun um, uh, uh, fibres that are stripped off and they come down and they're twisted with this automated yarn and it, it collects directly on a bobbin and we can take that bobbin and put that in the knitting machine to make the uh, products. We tend to get about a metre length of um, just on the mandrel, but you can obviously scale it up. I have a large mandrels or indeed the roll to roll that I showed you um, that we're putting within the bus. Good question, thank you. Excellent. And the next question for Aileen Miller. A uh, very interesting presentation, says Adam. Can your gels be used to produce organoid containing capsules via electrospraying? Um, good question, and uh, we don't know actually. Um, we've done uh, obviously done organoid studies. Uh, we've done use micro well, somebody in Cambridge is using micro microfluidics devices to do organoid growth in uh, droplets formed through microfluidic systems. We haven't tried electrospraying and I'm not aware of anyone that has. So interesting question and uh, happy to talk about it if they're interested in doing it. Yeah, absolutely. Please feel free to follow up um, on the chat. And also we have the speed networking in a moment as well. Um, first though, another question for Chris. Uh, thanks for the great talk, Adam says. How does your technology compare with ultrasound and microwave-based technologies? Um, so uh, there is a, an ultrasound technology that I'm, I'm very familiar with uh, in, in the glioblastoma space. Uh, it's a company called Carthera, who are going through phase three trials at the moment. Uh, essentially, that is uh, a device that sits on top of the brain, uh, between the, the brain and the skull. Uh, and uses high intensity ultrasound to uh, effectively punch holes in the blood brain, brain barrier, um, which then increases the access of uh, drugs into the brain. Um, they haven't um, actually released the, the results of that trial yet, so I, I can't um, make any particular comment on, um, on the efficacy. Uh, they are, in a sense, uh, a competitor to our technology um, because they are operating the same physical space in, in the head um, so we physically can't have both devices at once. Um, aside from that the, the electrotherapy is uh, designed as, a, as an adjunct, uh, a combinatorial therapy for, for use alongside radiotherapy and uh, pharmacological uh, approaches. Um, so and one of the nice things about it is that it doesn't interfere with those those other treatment pathways. So um, we uh, we and and very much the opinion of of our surgeons is that the, the future for the treatment of, of brain tumors is going to be through combinatorial treatment. So not um, you know, not relying on on a, a magic bullet cure uh, emerging because you know there's been decades of failures that have basically shown that's that's not there. Um, with respect to the the ultrasound technology, um, essentially because of its mechanism of action, it's it's relying on what drugs are available. Uh, and the truth is that uh, uh, you know there's been uh, devices launched and, and work in the past with uh, direct delivery of drugs into the brain, uh, so completely uh, avoiding the, the blood brain barrier, which is often spoken about as as one of the the big challenges of, of working in, in neuro oncology. Um, but it doesn't work, and well, not very well anyway. Uh, and that's in essence to do with the, the genetic makeup of, of uh, glioblastoma cells. Um, it's a very genetically diverse cancer, and that means it's very hard to find uh, pharmacological targets that are effective for it. Um, you also mentioned microwave technology. I've got to plead ignorance on this one. Um, I'm not aware of of a, a microwave uh, device, but there's, I mean, cancer is a huge research space and there's there's lots of emerging technology all the time. So there, there probably is something I'm just not aware of. And Sarah, finally, a question for you um, from Paulina about some of the workshops that you mentioned that are offered at the Henry Royce Institute. She asks, is there an opportunity for a prospective master's student to attend one of these workshops? Hi, Paulina. Yes, you'd be very welcome. Um, some of the workshops are specifically for SMEs or something like that, so not, not all of them, but it doesn't mean that you can't attend some of the more open ones. And we have one for PGR students, it might be a bit 
next week it might be a bit too late to sign up for that one but in the future i've just put in the chat um if you go to that link voice.ac.uk contact us you can sign up then to get the mailing list so you'll see all the different events that are coming through and anything that's of interest and of relevance you could sign up for um, you should have my contact details as well. If not, um, uh, just probably let one, you know, I could um, go to Gemma or, or, or Ruben and they can put us in contact. You can speak to me and I'll uh, let you know, particularly about biomedical things, if it's not automatically coming through. But yeah, yeah. you're pretty welcome. Yeah, we're definitely happy to, to arrange that, um, you know, depending on the consent of, of the speakers. So that concludes our panel and Q&A session for today. Um, and it actually concludes the end of this evening's event. So um, incredible thanks to all of our speakers um, and of course our generous sponsors, Manchester Biogel and VRF Recruitment. And also thanks uh, definitely not least to the team. So Ruben, um, I can see lurking in the backstage has done a fantastic job um, of curating this evening's event. So shout out to the entire uh, Innovation Forum Manchester team. Um, uh, please now do make your way to the speed networking section of the event. You'll see it on the left hand side of your screen. As I mentioned earlier, you'll be matched at random um, with other attendees of the event. And this is to try and simulate um, what a in-person networking experience would be like. So please do check that out. Um, we'll all be around on the chat function for the duration of the event um, for the next 10, 15 minutes. Please do chat with us, ask questions. Um, of course, follow us and Innovation Forum along with our sponsors and speakers organisations on social media channels. I'm sure they'd be happy to answer your questions. Um, and also please stay tuned for our Imagine If Local Finals event on the 22nd of April. Um, look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you very much and good night. <laughs>